Ahoy, fellow Morgs and I Morgs. And welcome aboard the Joy of Trek, an Ice Age podcast exploring the underground bunkers and go go boots of Star Trek. All, all of it. it. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. And with the mind of a child is your chief engineer, Greg. Together we're on a mission through the teacher's databank of Star Trek to find the givers of pain and delight and the good in every episode. Even the controller. Because every episode must be someone's favorite and it might as well be us. So stay above or below and join us as we remote control through the The joy joy of of Trek. Trek. (laughs) <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a fun one. This is an episode, we're going to be talking about Star Trek, the original series, season three, episode one. And unlike the previous episodes, which one of us has prepared, yes, we came in completely blind. I have never seen this episode no, before. No, nor I. So, yes, this was completely uh, new for us. And it was our engineer, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hey, guys. Well, <laughs> who prepared this for us. So let's see what he's, what he's written down. Oh, look, he's even made a recommendation as if somebody recommended it, All as right. if anybody would. In our ongoing mission to seek out the good in every episode, one came to mind repeatedly. Often regarded as one of the worst episodes of Star Trek ever, we took on our solemn mission to discover the joy that can be found in an episode as goofy as this. Just please don't take a drink every time brain is said. <laughs> Very good advice. I thought for a second maybe we should play that game because I saw that line and, you know, got my little dander up. Felt challenged, uh, uh, but I'm I very think glad. it would have been a very different kind of podcast if <laughs> we had sitting... we, couldn't, we could have pressed the right button. It would have been alcohol poisoning, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Oh, Greg has prepared a lot for us. There's, Absolutely, oh, there's yeah. trivia that... Yep. Maybe one of us should have read before. There's even a few few quotes. Here we go. Written by Lee Cronin, which I think is... Ah, yes, the pseudonym of Gene L. Kuhn. Uh, some have assumed it was used because he was unhappy with the results. Actually, it was because he had left Paramount and was under contract with Universal, so he was not supposed to be working for Paramount as well. Interesting. And mm. uh, directed by Mark Daniels, gets starring Marge Dussey as Kara, a veteran TV actress whose career spanned from 1967 to 2009. That woman's been around. Yeah. First aired September 20th, 1968. Do you want to read the synopsis? When the Enterprise encounters an iron-powered vessel far more advanced than their own war power technology... Wow, ions. They, <laughs> I, guess they, I guess ions were new. No, I mean... Imagine ions. Have, no, ions. Ions, ions have been no, around for like since, since Niels Bohr. Since electrons, right, yeah. Right, yes, okay. They soon find themselves knocked unconscious by a beautiful alien who suddenly appears on the bridge. When they come to, they find that Spock's brain has been surgically removed using technology way beyond their own current level of development. Following the the iron trail left by the spacecraft, they arrive at a barren, ice-covered planet where the men live on the surface and the women live in a highly advanced underground complex. Spock's brain is now the central intelligence that runs the entire complex. Whoa, what? And the problem before them, how to reunite his brain to his body. Okay. So, as I was watching this episode, I had a sort of thought and opinion. Mm-hmm. Like, my opinion changed over the course of the episode, but what was, like, your first impression as we were watching this episode of Star Trek? Well, I, okay, so... I. I've watched very, very little of the original series, so that's... uh, Every few years I think, oh, I'll give it a shot. I'll read and watch them all, and then I get like five episodes in. Okay, so first thoughts were, that's probably the first few notes that I uh, have written down. Oh, yeah, good one. It's like lots of intense staring. Yeah. Uh, Just people standing there looking dramatic for the camera. It's quite slow paced, especially by modern standards. I kind of dug that. It was. It was not, it it didn't feel wrong. And fantastic, hilarious overacting (laughs) by everybody. (laughs) Dramatic pacing. I was really sort of blown away by how I thought it was really good. It Uh, was. The the, the first half. Yeah. So, like, actually, let's do this. We've done this successfully before. Let's talk about what bothered us about the episode. Get that out of the way. Find a solution for that. Yeah, right. Good points. Good we, points. So, hugely sexist. Yes. Right? This premise that is revealed in the end that there was an Ice Age event and this comfortable environment was created for the women to live in, the delicate women. The yes. Of delight. And the men, well, the men stayed above. Right. Somehow. It's completely unclear why this was needed or what or how. Yeah. It's and that goes for the plot as well. This plot contrivance is completely unimportant to what we face. Yes. 
So I had an idea, which is instead of like seeing these morgues and amorgues as they're being presented, namely brutish men who are thumpy and, and, yeah. and airheaded, beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to use the word bimbo women because that's how they're being presented yeah. all in this. What if this episode had been made with like two different species of sentient bird or two different, you know, right. appearances like a rook and a crow? And that's how they were separated, right? So okay. visually, physically distinct, but without the sort of sexism and misogyny of how, right. how men and women are presented here. So let's say the uh, uh, the morgues are the crows and the eye morgues are the rooks. Like, it, it right. just doesn't matter. Because mm-hmm. if we take, like, this completely unimportant gender divide out of this episode, yeah. like, what's left is still, like, really good drama, actually. Well, yes, in a certain way. I mean, one of the things that I've got written down is actually, yes, extreme sexual dimorphism, which is a thought that came to my head when they were talking to the forced uh, Imar, yeah. uh, the, the one they shot unconscious on the planet. And I'm thinking, like, okay, look, yeah, we've got the women, and the, especially when they come to bringing pain and pleasure. I, I kind of figured that it was going to be something like that the women were an intellectual upper class. Right, uh, and that I they were that just too. That, that was, my, that was what, what my first thought going to be, especially in the light which we saw of the one appearing on the bridge of the Enterprise and, yeah. and of course, doing the brain surgery. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. But now they're just, like, just as stupid, except they left get to live in comfort. So, but even if it's, like, two different species, then it would still make little to no sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, and, and still matter as little to the right. plot. Like, uh, I'm absolutely not saying, like, let's forget about the sexism in 1960s <laughs> television because it was it, that was the time. That's not what I'm saying. It's absolute rubbish, and there's a lot of, like, Mm -hmm. implicit misogyny and gender roles here. But because they're unimportant to the plot, like, I actually can enjoy a lot of this episode because it would work just as well. Right, If it was an unproblematic, unimportant divide. It would also just have been as poorly integrated, right? Because we do want want Star Trek to do better than this. Of course. I don't know. I, I guess it's just to create another act. You well, know, we we have the, the first act on the Enterprise, second yeah. act, Discovery on the Ice Planet, third act, whatever goes down below, and maybe fourth act, the Resolution. Uh, fourth act, I would say, the brain surgery itself, right, which yeah. is... I mean, we'll get to that. It's manufactured yes. drama, but I don't mind that. Yeah. Right? Oh, when, it's, when it's presented well. And then suddenly, bam, we're back. Yeah. And just with a quip, with 30 seconds to spare before the end of the episode, we're, we're all done. Everything's finished, yep. Okay, let's get into the episode, and let's do the Rook and Crow thing, because if we actually address the horrifying sexism in this, I don't think we'll be able to totally enjoy it. Although the outfits are cool. So, we start off, I have it written as well, stare. What do you read, Mrs. Fox? Configuration unidentified, ion propulsion, high velocity, though of a unique technology. Because we no, get- no, actually, my first note is condition alert. Oh, yes. It's like, yes. <laughs> which I was like, hmm, okay. So isn't like just alert or red alert, just condition. Yeah, yeah you're expected <laughs> to see the colors. The, all of this is conveyed. The first entire minute is silent. Yes, very well done there. Because an, an interesting object has been spotted. Yeah. It turns out to be an iron powered ship. For some reason, the chief engineer is not in engineering, but he's on the bridge, he's flicking still- his bead. Yeah. At the sight of, oh, I've never seen anything like her. And ion propulsion at that. Oh, they could teach us a thing or two. Oh, oh she's yes. a beauty. Oh, <laughs> ions. Oh, ooh. I really like the sort of mise-en-scene or, or, or blocking or like the way the bridge is used in this episode, which is uh-huh. like the first episode of the third season. So people have been waiting like six months to see this again. Oh, yes. That is really used as this sort of office space. Because first of all, we start with Kirk pacing around the, the center console and doing that thing where he doesn't quite run his hand over it because yes. that is somebody else's workstation, but he clearly wants to. And how he clearly doesn't quite sit in his chair. Mm-hmm. Like he kind of half sits in his chair. Yeah. I, guess, I guess it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> also, I've got some new headcanon, by the way. Oh, well. That the reason that Mr. Spock has this little viewing device is yes. because Leonard Nimoy kept forgetting his lines so they have just like something that he can just <laughs> peek into <laughs> you think there's like a microfiche yep. reader <laughs> that's, 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 my, that's my new head cannon <laughs> that he click <laughs> hey great hair award goes to Scotty in this episode I oh. think uh, I hadn't noticed when well, he still had hair at that point wait 
James Dune. Oh no, right, you're right. He just went grey later. Yeah, so, he, yeah he's, he's grey when. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, he would have yeah. looked great if he's gone bald or shaved or, or whatever, of course. But it looks spectacular here, as does his outfit. I noticed, by the way, we're not watching the remastered editions. I just, uh, I uh-huh. just realised we're watching oh. the original uh, special effects here. So we're watching the non-remastered editions, it turns out, but these colours look spectacular still. So Best Hair Award, I'm giving to Scotty. Burying the Lead Award, I'm giving to Spock. But what do you mean by burying the lead? Okay, so the, the lead, L-E-D-E, is mm-hmm. uh, in journalism, when you're writing a news article, like that's the sentence that says everything about this news piece and then the rest are details. Oh, okay. And burying the lead means that instead of starting with that sentence that tells you everything that you're about to learn, you start off with something unimportant. Right. Right. This is uh, in essay writing as well. You say the most important thing first, and then you explain it in detail. So the most important thing is that... Instruments indicate a transferal beam emanating from the area of the humanoid life form. Directed at what? Directed at the bridge of the Enterprise, Captain. Yeah. But instead, Spock starts with, like... Humanoid or similar low level of activity, life support systems functioning, interior atmosphere, conventional nitrogen oxygen. I got that more as in, like, it suddenly ha- started happening. While he is giving his results with scan, he suddenly notices that there's a, uh, a transfer beam. Even like, then? Yeah. Like, where's the beaming at? Especially if it turns out to be the bridge of the ship, where right. you yourself are. Fair. That's the most important thing. Yep. Kirk says, security guard to the bridge. <laughs> I know women dressed like this as fembots because that's how they appeared in right. uh, Austin Powers. But of course, this was the 60s and this was just a really hot, like, go-go look that a lot of young women really went for. Well, I mean, yes, the very high boots, the very short skirts. Uh, Fantastic hair. Uh, we see also see several people other in, uh, well, not quite scants, but, you know, the short hem dresses that uh, the female crew uh, on the Enterprise wears, which is, yeah. A little bit longer than what our new arrival is wearing, but not much longer. No, no, it is a slightly wider belt. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. What was it again? In the old days, operations officers wore red, command officers wore gold. And women wore less. Thank you, Jadzia. (laughs) So this woman beams aboard. I think her name is Kala, Mm -hmm. if I got that right. And she's got this beatific smile. Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. And she just presses a little button, and everybody on the bridge falls asleep. And then she presses a few more buttons, and everybody else in the ship falls asleep. And she's at it for a while. It takes a while to get everybody to... We see people uh, in hallways falling over. We see people in... uh, Dramatic people draping across tables. Major Barrett right there as uh, Nurse Christine Chapel, Uh like, doing the extra role, and we get just a little bit of upskirt. (laughs) Because that's what Gene Roddenberry and his people liked. Oh, yeah, crikey. Even if we do the crows and and rooks thing, we're not going to get out of just the sexualization of women, especially in their invulnerable positions. Right. And she, she, she... kind of like dreamily walks across the bridge. Still smiling. Yeah. This is like the disguised alien from Mars Attacks. He's disguised <laughs> as one of these women. So yeah. I was thinking, oh, wow. So it's actually, it's actually uh, a brainian. Yes. And she's maybe she's like sampling people, like trying to get a taste for the various brains. But she, oh, is she? I don't know. She doesn't touch any people on the head, I think. Or maybe... No, only Spock, I think. She does sort of stop with Kirk, right. who is slumped over. Over his console, yes. He's got a nice ass on him. Does uh, uh, see that? Yeah. yeah. Well, those are that's fine glutes. Yeah. Well done, William Shatner. Uh, but if yes. only you'd stayed a good person. <laughs> it ends with her kind of like <laughs> fondly. His head. Yes. The his bowl head. Mm. Yes. Mm. The uh, the bowl cuts that uh, Spock has, and then we go to credits. I wonder if those credits are better in the remastered edition because they're. It's just. They're sh- I mean, just they're wishing. short. That is true. <laughs> hey, look, at, <laughs> look at you finding the good in every episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're terrible, but quite short. Yeah, these these reefs are throwing me off because they were made based on the remastered edition. Oh, okay. What happened? Helm status, Mister Sewell. No change from last meeting, sir. Oh, suddenly everybody wakes up. Oh, where is everyone? Where is Spock? Yes. And then amidst this mayhem, as all the departments are sort of reporting in... Yes, what is it? You better come down to sick bay. Right now. 
All right, on my way. And the commanding officer, who's still in the middle of receiving updates, leaves the bridge. Exactly, yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, we're not going to like start looking for the ship. We're not going to give commands. How many no. other people are missing? Right, like, Are there yes. casualties? But no, Does... no, Bone says, yeah, come on down. <laughs> and he leaves the bridge. He doesn't even point at anyone to take the con. No, no, nothing. You have the con. You're uh, nobody in, leaving nobody in charge. He just runs like off. the reverse of Pike walking into a briefing that he's late for and dismissing everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, what happened? I found him on the table. Like this? No, not like this. What happened? I don't know. Because we learned that he's on life support. Full life support because his brain is missing. Yeah. Which takes a while to get to. Like, this dialogue is, is very circumstantial. Right, like, yes. We're, like, we you, again, on- you'd say, like, you know, as you say, burying the lead, it's like, might have started with that, you know? Yeah. Like, his brain's gone. That's why we've got him like this. Someone stole but his brain. Here, I kind of get it. Because here it's character motivated, because Bones is just flabbergasted. And, okay. like, yeah. I get the feeling that he can't quite get the words out. He was worse than dead. What do you mean? Jim. Come on, Bones, what's the mystery? His brain is gone. He uh, can't believe it himself, you mean? Yeah. Okay, that's As we awesome. found him on the table, like this, asks Kirk. No, of course not. Not like this, says Bones mysteriously. Again, not elaborating on how he was different then, like... Yeah! Was his head still open? Did he have to, like, close the skull? Is he... That might have been it then, yeah. Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know! Because, yeah, his brain be gone. Just straight up gone, and it's a feat of medical engineering that yes. is just all beyond the nerves his. have been expertly cut. Yep, no, no ripping, no tearing. His body was able to survive before a life support system. Thanks to his assault. strong falcon physiology, which can only keep doing that for twenty four hours while on life support. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> this one is something we should also get out of the way because Kirk asks McCoy directly, like, "Bones, how long can you keep him functioning?" I can't give you any guarantee. That's not good enough, Doctor. If it happened to any of us, I would say indefinitely. But Vulcan physiology limits what I can do. Spock's body is much more dependent upon that tremendous brain for life support. And then at the end of the scene, he says, but definitely 24 hours max. (laughs) Yes. And apparently not needed to be on life support, as we later see, but we'll get to that. I started at this point circling every time that the word brain is said, and then oh I dear. just gave up. Yeah. I could have put a little tally mark up there. <laughs> ding! <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do that. We can do a ding. Oh, Greg, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to burden you with a terrible job. Do a little ding every time we say brain. Actually, starting now. start at the beginning of the episode, oh, and yes. I only now <laughs> explain to him. <laughs> can do, Commander. I'll put the final tally as well at the very end. Okay, now we get to the bit on the bridge, which uses the bridge like a conference room, which I really like. Uh Uh-huh. Because we see it, again, the console from behind, and we're looking at the view screen, but we actually see it from behind Kirk's chair. Yes. And he's standing up and walking around in front of this view screen and asks for some information to be put up on the screen. Right. Well, well, Dave, no, no, hang on. You're getting ahead of yourself. Oh, I'm... Okay, uh, first, first they they picked up an iron trail. Oh, yeah, So they're going to... System Sigma Tectonis. Which is, again, also really weird, so... Why? Max, no, I'll get to that later. Oh, uh, because, ooh, like, system, uh, system Sigma Draconis, local missile, Sulu, maximum speed, warp six. It doesn't say any engage or anything, but he just wanders in front of the uh, view screen, yep. does a little bit of dramatic pacing back and forth, and I'm just waiting for him to say engage or something like that, which he doesn't do. Uh, no, they just straight up go. Yeah. And the stars are stationary, even though they're at warp, because that's how warp looked back then. Yes. Oh, I wonder if in the remaster edition that they do streaks. Oh, good point, yes. Maybe. So, uh, uh, r- arriving in Sigma uh, Draconis, there is like, now here is where we get to uh, the scene you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, eight hours and 40 minutes left. This is also something that gets frequently repeated. How much time is left until the 24 hours are up? Because apparently he's like, as soon as the 24 hours are up, he's going to like fall it's over dead. Keel over. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because like, it's Vulcan timer running. Uh, <laughs> but they've lost the trail. 
Chekhov is asked to sort of give a presentation. Give a little presentation, which he apparently fortunately has prepared, because he throws some nav data up on the screen uh, describing the, the solar system, which apparently has one very eccentric orbiting planet. Oh, I see what you mean. And it's not even an outer one. No. So everything is in one plane except this, this other one little plane. guy. Sun spectral type, gamma nine. Nine planets, three of them class M, possessing sapient life, according to reports and long-range scanning. This whole scene is great, because they go, okay, there's a whole bunch of planets here. Well, no, this, this woman was breathing our air, so she must be on an M planet. Right. And then we have three of them with different levels of technology. Yes, uh, one... Letter B, yeah. which Kirk translates like... Earth equivalent approximately 1485. Awfully specific. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. One letter G, which... Industrial age. A tw roughly 2030. Yeah. And then another one that doesn't seem to have anything at all, says Mr. Sulu. So an interesting thing is, like, if he says roughly 2030, but no, they could not have... Either it was many years ahead of us, or it was the most incredible design fluke in history. And there's like, hang on, why not? If it's roughly 2030, then they should have been able to launch a rocket. But that should have been the obvious choice. Yeah. Yeah, especially because, you know, uh, the, the eugenics wars had already been, uh, right. been done and the SS Botany Bay had already been launched exactly. in the 90s. But it's Star Trek and canon. Canon has only very recently started to matter <laughs> in Star Trek. In yeah. Star Trek. And I think a lot of fans, as, as I'm on record saying, overestimate the importance of canon for enjoying fair, fair. Star Trek. But yeah, there's a lot of discussion uh, back and forth about how they're going to, like, and they have to guess right because. We only have time to visit one of these planets, I suppose. They're, they're really slow at away teaming. Right. But I, mean, I love how, like, it's a conference. All the senior officers are, like, giving it their full thought, mm -hmm. chiming in. Kirk's giving space to everyone there. He's not doing the, the sort of Kirk thing where he yells at people for having ideas that are... Right. Like, even when he states to Chekhov, so you're telling me that this energy is coming from this planet that it can't be coming from. And Chekhov goes, yes, sir. Well, you can hear the emotion in, in Kirk's voice. He doesn't, like, this doesn't make sense. It's not what he wants to hear. Can't afford to guess wrong. Better choose the right planet to get there, find the brain. But it's what his officer but has said. But it is, yeah, absolutely true. And, like, Uhura comes up with the best question of all. Why did they take that brain? What would they want with his brain? Which is of totally course. relevant. Like, figuring that out might help us to identify where they took it. There's no answers there. And eventually Kirk makes the, the sort of executive decision. Okay, we're going to... We're going to go to the glacier planet. And Sulu even asks... A hunch, Captain. A hunch, Mr. Sulu. A little bit. It's, it's not like we have better information. True. The other two planets don't have the technology for this. So let's go to the one which definitely doesn't have the technology for this because there's a strange uh, energy signature coming from there. You know, I can, right. like, <laughs> yeah. I can understand that decision. Also, I want to comment on how hilariously and ergonomic Uhuru's console is. Oh, and her chair as well. Like she's trying she, to do a sort of relaxed drape. I know, but she always has to like kind of reach forwards, like bent over. It's like she has to sit in the chair yep. and then lean over real forward far and then to reach out to all these buttons and things which are on her console. It's like, yep. it's ridiculously unergonomic. <laughs> <laughs> Does show off her figure. Actually, oh, yes. these uniforms show off everyone's figure. They're, mm. they're very tight when fitting. They're really still young and fit. Yeah. So they select this glacier planet. Yes, they beam to the location. God, these uniforms look good. And I was like, I haven't written on my jeeves here, because I, I, I write on them. Yeah. Like, this is great. And then they beam down, and then there's these sort of cavemen-looking right. guys. Which have... Sneaking up. And yes. I've got written down, oh, no. Oh, no, wait. Oh, no? <laughs> up to now was, I, I can't imagine why this episode is so poorly received. Like, it's even got, like, hot women in go-go boots. Like, this is awesome. And oh no! Wait no! Now I have. And here an idea we get where some cave going. women, which is which are like uh, dressed ridiculously uniform for cavemen. You know, yeah, <laughs> and, and their haircuts as well. Their haircuts, their haircuts, haircuts, are, their, <laughs> their haircuts are. Their shirts oh are. Their, their shirts are almost identical as are their loincloths, pants, whatever. Oh, they're, they're wearing pants. Pants like type things, loin wrap basically. They're attacked by the cavemen, they manage to stun one with the phases set to stun. And they do actually good flanking as they're, yeah, as yeah. they're being oh, they're, stalked. They're absolutely uh, showing good tactics, both sides actually. But yeah, one of them is uh, zapped. I want them conscious, says Kirk. And then interrogated. Where he says, We mean you no harm. We're not your enemies, we're your friends. Yes, we're here from. Uh, also, I'm thinking, like, there wasn't much of a prime directive back then, was there? 
uh, yeah. Ish. I mean, I guess they're hunting for a crewmate, but still. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, that's definitely Prime Directive violation. Yeah. But I kind of like... Like, he doesn't threaten this guy for being mm. on the planet that maybe someone came from the yeah. Steel Spock's brain. He opens with friendship, despite this conflict. Yes, we're trying to help you. And if you hadn't attacked us, then we probably wouldn't have shot you either. But yes, tries to figure out what's going on. The Others. Who are the Others? The Others. The Others. The givers of pain and delight. Yeah. They're not like you. You are so small because they're... They're supposed to be big. Like, Scotty mentions this a few times that they're really big. Humanoid, all right. On the large side. Five of them. Humanoid. Large. And, like, you know, they're maybe half a head taller than Kirk is. Barely. It's, yeah, it's... Barely. Like, I don't think they're taller than you. Probably not, no. Right, and you're <laughs> above average for a Dutch gentleman. And okay. But barely. Yeah. You know, uh... <laughs> I'm exactly average. <laughs> Right? Oh, you're too small. They do introduce themselves as men. We are men. Men? Yes. By which they mean humans, right. of course. We're men. Um, We're men in tights. <laughs> we rob from the rich and give to the poor. That's right. <laughs> Don't you have a mate? Mate. A companion? Asks, yes. Uh, Scotty. And he goes, this guy what? Like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Your words say nothing. So how they've been how have they been reproducing or do we assume that the women downstairs occasionally take men down and and, do and then they keep the girls and the boys get kicked back out of the service to live with the other men? That's a pretty horrible sort of cult. I mean that's the only thing yeah. I can come up with. I mean th that would have been my question is like okay where do new guys come from? Sometimes one of you guys dies and do new ones ever show up? Like yeah. how does that work? There's probably like a lot of backstory <laughs> that got cut in favour of, like, really lingering, quiet scenes, which I, I do kind of appreciate. Fair. Caveman runs off. Yep. Brief uh, struggle. And Kirk says not to follow it. Yeah. Which is also a uh, weird decision. Yes. I think they go looking for the source of the energy thing. Which they find in this cave that has, like, tons of food and tools in it. Right. Much more advanced than what the cavemen actually have. Yeah. And it's, it's discussed a bit. Like, is this, like... This is clearly beyond their technology level, so maybe it was left here to lure them. And there's, like, some Blinkenlichten on the wall, mm. which apparently are a beam, which might be warned about if something crosses that. It's it's all a little bit vague it's a and unclear. Little weak. Yeah. It could have used just a little bit more, like, discovery and exposition. But, yes. like, fundamentally, it's kind of cool. This is a trap to lure... The, the morgues in. I guess so, yes. And then they get taken down for pain and pleasure, and then... Yeah. I, mean, I can only see what the pleasure part is, you know. What? Is getting it on with the women downstairs below. I'm sure you notice the delight aspect of this place. Yes. That's an assumption. I know. That that's what happens. I know. We don't know what these, these know. morgues are into. It I may know. be something entirely different. <laughs> True. <laughs> but maybe that know, they... We're shown what the pain is. We're never shown what the pleasure is. So I'm... Exactly. My, 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 my... <laughs> I don't know, it's just like... Maybe they get just, like, a banjo lesson. <laughs> and it's... Imagine, imagine, ding, like... Ding, 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 ding. Yes! <laughs> well, or... Uh, it's not the only thing one can play on the banjo. I think it is legally mandated that it has to be a thing that you play. You're not allowed to play if you never <laughs> play dueling banjos. But Kirk immediately has an idea. He leaves this cave. Okay, it's a trap. If it will trap the creatures for the others, Captain, won't it trap us too? Exactly. Because its purpose is to achieve what we want to achieve, which is yes. to get to wherever this is. So he calls down, in good Star Trek tradition, the entire senior bridge crew gets uh, called down. Bones is asked to immediately transport down, and Bones brings Spock, whom he's to turned into a flesh robot. Yeah. This was <laughs> wild. I'm, I think I've got written down, that's not terrifying at all. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, this is Spockbot. Like, he didn't, he didn't just bring down, you know, a hover stretcher. I've actually literally got that written as Spockbot. You know, that's not you creepy too? at all, Spockbot. It's right yeah. there. <laughs> oh, now we have to figure out what S-P-O-C-K stands for. Spockbot <laughs> self propelling oh i got us that far self, yes self organic propelling. organic definitely um cerebellumless yes okay painted ourselves in a corner here cerebellumless uh, um uh oh, kinetic it's easy yeah doesn't really do it self-propelling we already covered that so yes maybe a silent k that'll be it yes 
knacker. Sort of rhythmless knacker, knacker. yes. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't even know what a knacker is. Oh, a knacker is someone who kills horses. A cool. knacker, knacker's yard, remember? Oh, okay, and that's... Maybe not that one. We'll figure out the K later. Maybe maybe this was a mistake. And McCoy has this little remote control that must be, like... Super advanced, like... It's got 16 buttons, so he must be doing cording like a stenographer. Well, there's a little twisty button on it as well, I think. So many... It is weird. But, it, yeah, it's really creepy. And also, there's l- this little ticking sound whenever Spock is walking. I know, like he's made of clockwork. Yes, it's like... <laughs> okay, I want to find out more about this. So I'm going to look at the trivia and quotes section that uh, oh, Greg has prepared for us. Oh, yes, let's yeah. do that. So let me see. So we talked about Jean L. Kuhn. Uh, according to her official website, Marge... Oh, I, I, I said Dussie. It's actually Dussay. Said she had not viewed this show until a fan sent her a VHS tape in the 1990s. The multitude of autograph requests she received over the years led her to believe that this show was popular. She described having fun in the role and that she was delighted with the costume and boots designed for her. Okay, well, that's great news. In I Am Spock, Leonard Nimoy wrote, Frankly, during the entire shooting of that episode, I was embarrassed, a feeling that overcame, <laughs> overcame many. me many times during the final season of Star Trek. <laughs> Uh, well, it may, was, must have been fairly easy for him to play this. Like, he doesn't really have to, a lot of lines in this episode. I know, but how em- embarrassing must it be for an actor of Leonard Nimoy's talent to be forced to just walk around like a machine? Fair, yes. This is why Denise Crosby, or one of the reasons why Denise Crosby reportedly left The Next Generation, Yeah, she had to be on the bridge the whole time. She had to be standing there while other people had conversations. So... Uh. Like, she even said, can we just not have some prop legs made? Because that's all of me that's in view and that's relevant for this scene. That's the actress who plays Tasha Yar? Exactly. Right, yes. <laughs> this was the first episode to come out after the letter-writing campaign that saved the show from cancellation. Well, I'm sure that a few people wanted their stamps back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, yeah. Beginning in season three, a new showrunner came aboard, Fred Freiberger, and NBC cut the show's budget by $15,000 per episode, while the cast got raises and put in an undesirable time slot for their audience. This can help explain why season three has more contained episode and less on location. Mm. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. wow. And organ transplant were in the cultural zeitgeist at the time. The first successful heart transplant was in 1967. That's amazing. I think that was in uh, South Africa, if I'm, uh, my memory serves me right. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, David Gerald, uh, one of the writers of Star, Star Trek. Uh, I don't think Gene Kuhn deliberately set out to write that episode seriously. Oh, interesting. I don't think there's any way to take that episode seriously. You've got to take it as an in-joke. What's the stupidest science fiction idea to do? What if somebody stole Spock's brain? Uh, Gene had that sense of humor to do that impish stuff. He had an irreverent sense of humor and wanted to poke Star Trek because someone was taking it too seriously. Yeah. It's possible. I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume that David Gerald knew Gene Kuhn better than we do. But there is a lot of fun to be had. And now we have to take the self-propelling, organic, cerebellumless... Yeah, whatever. Spock. <laughs> Spockbot. Spockbot, seriously. No, 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 no. Spockbot. <laughs> so, yes, they walk into the cave, uh, and it's not entirely clear how they trigger it, but this, like, this curtain comes rolling down. Yeah, Kirk takes one step forward. Oh, that was what you were does talking he, about. Like, does that, he step into the beam? Is that, that what must happens? be it. And the door comes down and they start moving. And Everybody then... does this little suddenly going through their knees thing, <laughs> because apparently they're on the lift. They're in an elevator. While Chekhov and the security red shirts walk over to a rock and Chekhov, like, grabs his face and says, well, we might as well be comfortable. Yep. Shoots it at a rock for a little bit to heat it up. Twice. I noticed that. Like, yes. uh, not hot enough. <laughs> just a little, a little, a little bit, bit warmer. warmer. Yeah. And then they all uncomfortably, like, kneel and crouch around this rock that they're warming their hands on. Right. I mean, wouldn't it be clever to, like heat the rock you're going to sit on just a little bit you know? oh that's nice not not to a red glow obviously but just no, like heat not, it up but just to take, take, the, take the chill off you know it's <laughs> Scotty's got a tricorder yes burying the lead once again he's, he's vying for that on that power we picked up a source we're getting we're getting closer a lot of it enough to push this planet out of orbit, orbit yes it's the size of a hundred mile nuclear, nuclear pit. pyre pit or it's irons or, again uh, it's irons. Irons. <laughs> and then the door opens with the sound that I swear, Greg, back me up on this. It's Darth Vader breathing. 
It's exactly it, right? I can't say I noticed it. No, at the time, okay. But, yes, there's a lass uh, standing there in the hallway going like, oh, the, the elevator full of boys is coming. Oh, the so- boy vator. The boy <laughs> delivery service has, has arrived, which she solo expected to receive. And she reaches for her armband again. Yeah. But Kirk, Kirk shoots, is, shoots Kirk her is her on the draw. He's already chest. got his phaser on uh, stun. And, uh, Another upskirt there. Oh, yes. So there is, yes. And now they're down with the crows. Yes. Because we have the rooks upstairs. And- she all right? I'll have her talking in a minute. And there's more sort of confusion about hi- him. What is him? Right, mm. yes. And they are just, yeah, turns out that she doesn't have a lot going on upstairs. That's a bit of a judgment. Well, on the part of a medical professional. <laughs> Fair point, yeah. An alien whose home you've just invaded, who yeah. you've just also shot, does not understand certain <laughs> concepts. And, oh, they must be a nincompoop. Yeah. This, this must be a, one of those soft-brained people. <laughs> oh, don't bother talking to her. She has soft brains. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 she I agree She has the complete. mind of a child. I hey. know, I agree completely. It's <laughs> Beep, I'm right here. <laughs> But yeah, she tries to make a run for it. She gets. I swear uh, stopped, to God, you know? if someone no, if Bones were to diagnose me after waking me up from bed in the morning yeah, and I'd giving like me a, like <laughs> seats, I would have the mind of a child in his eyes. Like, wait, what? I'd like a second opinion, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> tries to make a run for it, but oh no, it gets stopped. <laughs> Because, you know, these are some big, strong men. No, 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 we were going to do... She's a crow. She tries to fly away. Right. And then Scotty the, receives a signal, a weird signal. On the yes, call. because he, apparently it turns out that they can talk to Spock. Fascinating. Activity without end, but with no volition. Yeah. Because, like, they hear Spock. Spock's sounding a little bit confused. He's, like, he's not really sure where he is. I don't yeah. think he, is, he, hasn't, he hasn't quite figured out that he is bodiless now. No. He even talks about it. He has a body because he has... Captain, there is a definite pleasurable experience connected with the hearing of your voice. Oh, yes. Ooh! That's, that doesn't sound very Vulcan. To talk about it, no. Yeah. Because that's the, that's the Vulcan thing. That, yeah, right, yeah. And that's not a retcon. Like, that's something that Gene Roddenberry was pretty serious about, like, back in the day. They are highly emotional, passionate people, but they right. don't express it. Yes, like they, that's, that's all, what it's all about. So, uh, yes, they come across the leader lass who is flanked by two burly males, which is, again, weird. So why did the earlier girl go like, ooh, who is him or they and men? When there's, like, dudes they're morgues, all over the place. Yes. But they're morgues. Oh, uh, right. right. They, I, I don't know I, what pronouns I'm they use. Or maybe yeah. they, yeah, and, and the, or they're, uh, I'm which or, one are they? I think the I'morgs are the, are, are the dudes. You are not I'morg, you are not morg. Ah, whatever. Morgs and the eye morgs. The the, the yeah. crows and the and the oh, jets and sharks. We could have done jets and sharks, <laughs> except actual cri- anthropomorphic jets and actual and anthropomorphic bl- crips and bloods. Mm. Mm. Probably getting its connotation that we should dodge. <laughs> Maybe we should, let's do the crows and rooks. I think that's the safe. Let's, let's keep with that. But uh, yeah, she's, uh, however, quicker on the draw than uh, Kirk is this time, and everybody gets zapped out again. Except for Spock, but oh, yes. you know, without his remote control. Standing there, just doing nothing. And when everybody comes to, they are in a... A conference room. Conference room, there. yeah. How about that? This scene starts with, with Kirk narrating his captain's log, despite the fact that right. he's unconscious. Captain's log, star date 5431.6. Immediately after making contact with Spock's brain, Dr. McCoy, Engineer Scott, and myself were taken prisoner inside a highly complex civilization. While these women ah, yes. are sort of giving a, a mission update to each other as well, but Luma is doing it through mime. She's miming like pew, pew, uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, Which is so, so I, awesome. So I noticed that like they seem to do that. I don't know if that was a common thing in Star Trek, but like after every, what I assume is commercial break, there's a quick little recap like of what happened so far and what's going on, basically. Maybe for yeah. people who started like channel zapping while they were at commercial break and then, oh, it's Star Trek, let's keep watching that. And exactly. getting a little story update, like what's going on. I mean, this is how all of television was written. Like you have to be able to retain an audience that just arrives after a commercial break or like remind people of where mm. they were because commercial breaks certainly in America were long. I don't know how long, if they were that long back then, but I suppose so. Uh, 
Well, considering how slow television was, the extreme stimulus of a commercial might have been <laughs> overwhelming to the soft brains oh, yes. of 1960 people. I don't know what they can handle. Yes, they're they're feeding the, the guys, they're getting some snacks, the guys that are standing around, and then the boys are woken up. Yeah, and they face this tribunal of women, and how terrifying this is presented as, as being, like, oh, unconscious men, and they're now being judged by sentient crows. Yes. Sorry, that's where we're going. <laughs> sentient crows are now trying to figure out what is going on. What have we said? What are we doing here? And they're still not accepting the confrontation that they stole Spock's brain. What have you done with Spock's brain? We do not know Spock. This is Spock. Yes, they don't. They have no idea what we're talking about. I'm the leader here, but uh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. It's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. I think I like it. I think I like that this is being teased out and that... You're still not getting to the nugget of motivation. Right. You, you really start to wonder what's going on. It's like, okay, what, are these people nincompoops? What, like, are they just playing them? What's going on? Like, why do we not have a resolution here at this point? But the great thing is that gives us the opportunity to piece it together first, because we, yes. we hear disembodied Spock, like, talking about, oh. My medulla oblongata is hard at work, apparently breathing, apparently pumping blood. Apparently maintaining a normal physiologic temperature. Medulla oblongata. <laughs> what are you quoting now? No, I was trying to like trying to go for the Lion King TLK. <laughs> <laughs> Medulla, Medulla oblongata. oblongata. <laughs> what a wonderful organ. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Engineer Greg here. There's something I have to wonder about this. That this is a good time to talk about as any. As someone with a BA in psychology, my question does become, is the entire brainstem still attached and it's the just the cerebellum that's missing or not? Because if the medulla oblongata is there, okay, then he can still regulate his body temperature and everything. The, the pons would still be there and the thalamus would st still be there. I have to just kind of wonder what parts they took because when you're referring to the brain, oftentimes you include the brainstem as well. It's part of the physiology of it. So... I just have to wonder, what were they quantifying the brain as? Was it only the cerebellum they were referring to? Did it include parts of the brain stem? That is what I would like to know most about all of this. I don't care about the rest of it. I don't care about the fact that it's physically impossible. I, I don't care. I just want to know, where are you drawing the line on what the brain is and is not? Gene L. Kuhn, I want answers. But these crows, as much as they're sort of, you know, unreceptive, they're perfectly reasonable. Yes, until they start like piecing the, together what they're here for. Because they don't know, even know what a brain is. Brain and brain! What is brain? Right, until, and there's a conceptual language barrier, and they're like, no more harm can be done by you, but if you want to leave, you're free to go. Yeah, bye. But then they kind of figure out that a brain is a controller, and then they start, start going like, oh, no, 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 you can't take the controller. We can't take you to the controller. Yeah. And you cannot take the controller from us. Because who built these machines? Mm. You soft-brained crows couldn't possibly have done no, that. No, but that gets blank stares. It's like, who built this place? It's always been like this. Oh, you mean the controller? Yes, the controller. The controller. Right. Everybody's bearing the lead. Right. Everybody's just yeah, yeah. sort of... Mm. But maybe because it's so obvious. Maybe because it's, like, yeah, to them. Like, imagine this. An alien comes to you right, yeah. in this sort of circumstances uh -huh. and says, why do you not fly away? Yeah. What do you answer? I left my flying boots at home. Well, okay. Yeah. Let's try you being, you being right. saying, oh, I don't have wings. Wings? What is wings? No, right. I don't have propulsion. Yeah. And then you, okay, oh, oh, because my planet has gravity. Oh, is that why you don't fly away? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, so obvious that it wouldn't occur to you to say right. something like, we have gravity here. Yes. Okay, fair. I see, what, I see your point here. But yes, they, they insist, no, we want to see the controller, and what's her name gets vexed and does... Kirk falls to his knees. Yeah. Oh, great leader, take us to your controller. And she goes like, no, pushes a button on her uh, Apple Watch, and... Uh, Everybody does dramatic. Like, Kirk doesn't get an upskirt because his tunic's not long enough. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, there's like the dramatic falling in uh, onto the floor and writhing around. Again, everybody except Spock. Yeah. And they are left to their own devices. The rooks are uh, uh, left being left there to keep an eye on the boys. Now, they look extra big because of their hats. 
I guess so, yes. They also have their beards trimmed nice, yeah, these ones. I mean, I can imagine that the rooks would like to have the crows. I know, I've got who's the crows and who's the I rooks. I know, now. I know. Uh, Capulets and Montagues, does that help? <laughs> no, not even slightly. <laughs> Because their equipment is just right there on the table. Yes. And, and just a burly rook doesn't want to let them touch yeah, it. Yeah, pre- prevent it uh, from going to grab it. So Kirk, Bones and, and Scotty do the sort of Star Trek maneuver of talking loudly about one thing. This fellow is keeping us from our property. While actually, wink, they mean let's fight. Well, isn't there a way to correct that situation? I certainly think that science might provide an answer. It does, Captain. Agreed, Doctor. They mean, let's fight. Let's have a clumsy... Yes, we get it. not that clumsy. Uh, I mean, it's like uh, it it gets ended by uh, Kirk's patented double-handed fist bump to the back, which knocks people out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Pentac jab, but... (laughs) Kirk is the superior fighter here, of course, because the soft, muscled Scotty and, yeah. uh, oh, and right. bones. Like, it takes two of them to, to hang off one of these uh, Yes, these whereas rocks. Kirk manages to uh, best the one that he's fighting on his own. And takes out the other one with a flying kick to the chest. Yeah. Right? Props to the stuntman. No, oh, true. And yes, the, the double-fisted punch, which, if you threw a punch like that, you'd break your fingers, right? If you've got them intertwined, yeah, probably. That's what they've... Yeah, yeah. They've got them intertwined. <laughs> yeah. So that's a finger-breaking... That's probably a, not a good idea, no, no. So there's further communication with Spock, now that they've got... S-B-O-C-K, now that they've got their communicators. And we've, we get the first glimpse of the controller, I think. The box, oh, yes. The box containing Spock's brain. That's just edited in without context. No, well, well it's kind of... Assume because it's like, well, while Spock is speaking, you see the light blinking on the thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's like, it's not difficult to grok that that's w- w- where the brain is. But that's what I love so much. Like, it's it's pretty smart throughout. And then this is a really obvious clue. Kids yeah. were watching too. True, yeah. Right? Lots of kids, teenagers, Star Trek had enormous appeal across age ranges and gender lines, of course. They told Spock to send out a signal. Beam us a signal so we can home in on you. Acknowledged. Ah, yes. Uh, allowing them to... Uh, go and find him. And yes, there's more clockwork ticking as Spock is walked out of the building, this time controlled by McCoy again. Keep concentrating, Spock. Keep concentrating, Spock. Repeating it so... On, yeah, on the signal, I guess, so that they can keep following that. The cyber Spock, which I think... Yeah, we've got Spockbot and we've got Cyber Spock. How about that? Sure. Okay. Tells them, oh, your pain bands are controlled through a bracelet, which may not make a lot of sense. And Kirk says, yeah, it does. Yeah, they're manually controlled, but uh, yes. And then by pushing the red button, we'll deactivate them. They find the room that the, the brain bot is in. Cyber uh, Spock. Uh, Cyber Spock. And that is where, uh, what's her name, is standing rather mopishly. Carla the Crow. Carla, she immediately yes. uses the pain bands on them. Right, and it's like it, it's it's kind of ridiculous how they kind of wander in. Maybe they don't see her, but it seems it it doesn't seem likely that. Uh, I mean, Kirk is kind of like scanning the oh, room I see what you mean. around, and then she hears them while she's standing there, yeah. like she's behind the bike shed waiting for her boyfriend to arrive or not. You know, that's how she's standing there uh, in the. Uh, what was she doing there? I don't know. Right, it's <laughs> maybe that's a segment that we should have because this is like. There are those WTF moments that just, when you really sort of analyze, don't really make a lot of sense. You know, like in that Voyager episode that we did, these, uh-huh. these two nurses that brought Tom Paris into sickbay and then just Disappear, left. yes. Like, what is this person even doing here? Like, in the middle of a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just sort of standing around watching the warp engine. Yeah. What was she doing in this room? Yeah. She seemed to be just sort of idling like an NPC from Existence. Yep, that's... Uh, oh, God, that's long, been a long time since I saw that movie. But so she activates their pain bands, and they're all right on the floor, and then McCoy drops the remote and says, Oh, the remote, Spock, not pain! No. And uh, Kirk crawls manages to over, crawl over. So slowly. Yes, she just stands there doing nothing, watching them writhe around in pain, while Kirk manages to control Spock to... Walk towards her, grab her by the arm. He's doing some good, He's good really radio controlling stenography uh, uh, cording yeah. to the point where, like, to press the right button. I know. Manages to grab her by the wrist and push the red button, which causes all the pain bands to pop off. Their belts pop off. That must have been fun to do, that they all had to sort of fall in, in positions where they could hold on to their opened right. belts and let them just <laughs> pop off. We'll die. You must not take the controller away. We will all die. The controller is young and, and powerful. Perfect. 
Yes, and this one will be a... How very flattering, says yeah. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> this one will last us for 10,000 years. Oh, yeah, we have another comment. Her mind is functioning on a very simple level. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. But that is revealed. There's a sort of cerebro right. sitting they there. They call which, it the teacher. Which can apparently like, implant a lot of knowledge in someone for a limited period of time. Yeah. Which then vanishes again. It's like downloading a Namshop, I believe. Uh, oh, uh, sick... Diamond Age reference. No. There. No, it not wasn't. The oh, Age, no, know. it was the wrong one. <laughs> Damn it. Dang. Oh, no. Which it, one was it? Snow it Crash. Snow Crash. Six yes. Snow Crash reference, bro. <laughs> uh, yikes. I should break my glass knives in shame. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, that was the one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that the one. Was, okay, so it's, yes. It's the one with the kayaking... Uh, the, the kayaking assassin. Yes. And the Namshub spell. Yes, okay, I'm going to earn that credit back. I will, I will earn your <laughs> your favor back. But yes, it's like a Perspex uh, dome with all these uh, and rods screwed into it. It's a taped storehouse of knowledge, which... I guess tape was all the rage at the time, you know? Yeah, I mean, tape was like the most advanced mass storage medium. So yeah, you talk about tape, like, whoa, that's, that's incredible storage. So much hard disk space, yes. But yes, they they demand that she shows how it works, but she will not. But a Spock brain will uh, know how it works. And basically, they shove her under it, put the thing on her head, and... Her hair is volumized. Yep, there's Blink and Lichten going on, and then her nature, demeanor changes. Gentlemen, the controller's explanation of the functioning of the teacher is essentially correct. However, he is giving no credit to me. I provide the means whereby the knowledge is used. Boom. Yep. I'm looking here. I wonder if her makeup changes as well. Because she's got like some, some cool blue. I do not know what eyeshadow and mascara are and how they're different, but there's a there's an eye makeup. Uh, oh, no, she did have it before. I think mascara is for coloring the lashes. And, okay. Um, and eyeshadow is for painting the eyelids. Oh, cool. But that's just my very limited knowledge. I know. We never got to play with that sort of stuff growing up. Not really. Um, and suddenly, not- like, she's smart and aggressive. Yes. And now it took me a while to figure out because, like, initially I was thinking, like, maybe, like, a personality override. Uh-huh. Like, something else was, like, operating her body now. That kind of felt like it, yes. But I think we're supposed to believe otherwise. We're supposed to believe that she's still Kala, if I'm saying her name right. Okay. But now she has an enormous amount of information at her disposal. And so, like, her agenda is the same, but her mental capabilities and the knowledge that she has at her disposal is vastly increased. Yeah for a limited period of time due to this teacher, which then fades again, and she returns back to the age of innocence. It surely fades a lot faster here than while she was on board her spaceship. Yeah. Well, I mean, she did have an ion drive. Maybe it just took her 20 minutes to just find the nearest starship and just beatifically walk on board, smile at everyone that she's rendered unconscious, and then pick the juiciest brain that she could see. Yeah. She didn't even check the rest of the crews. It's just, hmm. No, that one, yeah. I'll have that one. Good thing is, though, that she has lots of knowledge, and among the knowledge that she has is how to use a phaser. Yeah, which she just grabs from, from them. under her... No, no, she has it under her skirt. Oh, she, she had she, her she, own. She'd taken, the, she'd taken the weapons from them earlier. That was the only part of their equipment that wasn't left behind in the room, the phasers. Oh, uh, oh I was so dis- yeah, no, you disappointed, can see, actually. You, you can see her, actually. It comes out of that very short skirt, so it must be a short-barreled phaser, because otherwise there's no way she can hide that under the... Uh, I know that you're a gay man. <laughs> As I am, yeah. I have some news to tell you about what girls are like. <laughs> Let's not go there, shall we? And also, hold on, one doesn't need to be a girl to, uh, no. to have a vagina. There's, there's other no. things that we can... Hey, Greg, I... I, why did you go there? Why did you, why did you have to... What? <laughs> go, uh, d- you know... Never mind. The body is we, beautiful. We didn't I'm have going... to bring prison pockets into the whole discussion. I was just going to ask Greg <laughs> if he thought that this was okay to leave in, but I kind of... I think we're past that now. Sorry, Greg, it's in. <laughs> oh, okay. So we're now calming me when you're having an argument. All right, all right. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll... Sure, it's in now. It's in now, guys. Unlike the phaser. Right. Which is out. Yes. And she's doing so. what, she, what on, she learned from Lewis. And to kill. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, you don't want to mess about with that. The controller will, will live for 10,000 years. And just for a second, I thought of Rita Repulsa from Power Rangers. Who oh, goes, finally, <laughs> after 10,000 years, I'm free! <laughs> <laughs> 
There's some moralizing. No one may kill a man, not for any purpose. It cannot be condoned. I'm going to assume that he meant person. Yeah. Says Kirk here. There's a little bit of uh, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. Yeah. I mean, I, this could have been a pretty cool scene. Right. It isn't. <laughs> let's, be, well, let's be honest. Let's be honest. I mean, <laughs> it isn't. There's, there's a lot to be said about other scenes. But this is not one of them. We have Kirk doing his best sort of tantrum. You must put it back. You must. Yes. As if that's going to work. And she goes, No. And even she says, I will not betray my people. The controller will stay. That is a very firm and like justified position from her point of view. Now, as we discover later, this is a false premise, is the mm-hmm. perspective of, of Kirk. Like, by maintaining this controller, yet another computer system that maintains an ideal society of innocents who are yes. robbed of their uh, rugged independence. Instead, you need to learn that for yourself. Yeah. As if that's so great. Yes, yes. I think that 80% of your population needs to starve and, like, descend into warfare as you... Uh, and then you'll be so much better for it. Like, yeah. just, you don't need handouts. You well, don't need a social support network. You don't need to take care of people. You don't need empathy. No, it's like go live. Just, yeah, yeah, basically go live on the surface with the other with the rooks and uh, yeah, have fun on your ice planet because it'll be great. It'll just be chaos anyway. Because that's, that's kind of glossed over what it's like. What's going to happen to this society after the the, the brain is gone? You know, that's like it's not never yeah. mentioned at all. It's a foregone conclusion, but I think yeah, without the controller. This is not a habitable environment. Wouldn't think so, no, considering we learned that basically the controller controls the, the, the airflow and Air the filtration, filtration and oh, all, this, yeah, yeah, all, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, yes, that's completely, yeah. Anyway. I wonder if the teacher will continue to work after the controller's gone. Hmm, possible. Yeah, right. I mean, if it does, then, then, yeah, these people could be taught how to do these things, I guess. I mean, someone who who is wearing the teacher might be able to, like, overcome the three-hour limit yeah. or create some other kind of system that is a shareable resource. Yeah. Because someone with that knowledge might be able to develop an entirely, you know, superior system that doesn't need a brain. Ah, oh, damn, I said it again. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've gone a while without saying I the B so, word. yes. But the decision is made to shove Bones into the device and give him the knowledge to... I guess I get the impression that the controller is deciding what the teacher puts in someone's brain. Right, I agree. I, I can't fully figure it out. Either it all gets put in there. Right. Or some specific subset. I'm really not sure. But he, he comes out. Oh, yes. And, well, they, they talk about the risk to him. And McCoy actually makes a, a really good case. Like, I'm a surgeon already. If I could learn these techniques, I might be able to retain them. Like that would be really useful, yeah. Advanced surgical techniques that could help the galaxy. Unfortunately, no such thing. Because uh, uh, the Cyber surgery Spock starts, yes. Has uh, previously doubted McCoy's ability to do it. And McCoy goes, oh, oh, mm. yeah. <laughs> no, that knowledge doesn't exist anywhere. And now we get a really drawn out s- surgery scene. Which is kind of weird because, like, like, Bones is standing behind like a console desk, yeah. which Spock is lying in front of. And it took me the longest to realize that he's actually just got his, the top of his head in that the console. The very so, top. Yeah, the, so that's just how the brain surgery is done here. We never get to see brains getting floated around or taken from place A to place B. That gets completely uh, glossed over. And yeah. he is, he's basically hooking up the connections. Hi, Chief Engineer Greg here. I need to chime in again. This is actually a very good representation of how brain surgery is done today. So the patient is still awake because you need to be able to make sure that you're not doing something and causing damage along the way. When you are doing brain surgery, there's no pain receptors in the brain, so it's not like they can feel what's going on when you're poking in there, but the surgeon can tell what's going on. There is also sort of like a tarp of sorts over the top of the skull that they would be removing. So this is actually a fairly remarkable show of what brain surgery is. I do have to give them credit for this. This is actually very impressive. It's done in this wonderful sort of montage of like crossfading while there's a voiceover reminding us again of the peril that we're facing. And it's really cool. Like McCoy is lit from below and we see Kala. I'm going to look up her name now just to make sure that I've been saying it right. Kara. Kara. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, Should have done that sooner. But then, oh, oh, his brow furrows does bones because... All the cannulas nerves there are a million of them what am i supposed to do it's fading it's fading even though previously he said a child could do it yeah and now it's fading and a stepping application is not an option so 
he just has to muddle on with what he's got. And so Kirk suggests, hey, attach his voice first. Right, then he can help you. Yeah. Quickly, while you still know how to do it, like, hook up his voice box. Smart. Very good, yeah. Yeah, genuinely. And he uh, he does sort of help, and you've got the you've got the finger twitch. Okay, now do the rest of the hand. Now do the elbow, because the elbows connect to the shoulder bones. bones yes, <laughs> well, they're all being connected by bones. And Spock is fine, and launches into a monologue about the unimportant backstory of these rooks and crows that he thinks is absolutely fascinating. And here, like all the tension fades out as everybody silently stands around him, yammering. A remarkable example of a retrograde civilization, at the peak, advanced beyond any of our capabilities, and now operating at this primitive level which you saw. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> at first you think, oh, this is going to be relevant and interesting, and then it just keeps going and going and going. And it's absolutely nothing, yeah. And then Bones goes, oh. Uh, I should have never reconnected his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> end of episode. Just end. Yep. And I didn't know you could just end episodes like that. I guess. I mean, if you've got a cold start, you can have a cold, <laughs> you have a cold ending. Oh, we made it. Cool. Joke. Out. This is like, this is like Beverly retiring from, from Starfleet. I'm leaving Starfleet. Energize. Yeah, bye. Just energizing her way out of this, uh, out of this amazing episode. Episode. Okay. So, Spock's brain. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. <laughs> Kay, did you just call me Dan or Dave? What? Okay. Anyway, this episode has 54 instances of the word brain. Oh crap, 55. I can't say it anymore. Oh no. Okay, what are we going to call our segment where we talk about the thing that made no sense? Oh, well, in this case, that would be the episode. No, that's not <laughs> fair. There's going to be like a, a completely trivial thing that really doesn't that really doesn't matter. Like Okay, because one of my candidates is Chekhov's second phaser burst to, to heat the rock just a little oh, just bit more. Oh, just to heat up a little bit more? Wow. It's like like squirting the, the, the your lawn one more time, just because it's fun to pull the trigger, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess so. All right. In that case, oosh, mine is going to be, I guess, the... Uh, pike briefing. That's what we're calling it. The, the pike briefing. What's, what's your pike's briefing? Pike's briefing. <laughs> I guess it's mine's how... Uh, Kirk, Actually, uh, because it, he to curtails it, so it's just a brief. So what are your Pike's briefs? Pike's briefs. Okay. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> that put my mind into a different... Uh... <laughs> okay, are you having fun making a podcast with me? Oh, still yes, fantastic. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> oh. I'm not asking you, Greg. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know he's having fun. Okay, fair enough. I assume he's having fun. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's just going to be the way Kirk paces in front of the uh, of oh, view screen. Oh, yeah. How he just like gives and orders warp six. He never gets says, says engage or make it. Uh, did Kirk have a uh, thing? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I don't know for sure. I think I think engage sometimes. Energize certainly. Right. Yes. As for the uh, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. Like his hovering his hand over this console yeah. as if like He's Sulu not- and Chekhov have reported him to HR for touching their console <laughs> yes. all the time, <laughs> and he like he knows not to. <laughs> He's like a dog who knows that he's not supposed to lick anybody's faces, but like he loves you just so little, much. Just a little bit. <laughs> he just really wants to. <laughs> okay. Oh, there was one more candidate, wasn't there? The standing around person. Oh, oh the way, yeah, the way, what the, Kara the way, was doing uh, in the... Kara, Kara standing the, around, yes. <laughs> he just walked in there like, oh, another room to be in. What a great room this is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the room with the teacher. What a day I'm yeah. having. First that room, now this one. <laughs> What's next for old Kara? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there's another bit of trivia. We missed another bit of trivia. Oh, did we did? Yeah, 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 yeah. So original scripts featured another fun gag. After McCoy completes the brain transplant or implant surgery, Spock experienced several side effects from McCoy having reversed the connection of several nerve endings, mm. causing Spock to, among other things, laugh when he wanted to sneeze. He is, however, able to restore the ed- errors with his own mental discipline. Oh, he managed to rewire his... His uh, own brain, brain or just... Oh, yeah. Okay, I mean, I guess so. Oh, I guess that's like the C-3PO gag in The Empire Strikes Back when Chewie puts him back together. Right. Like, oh, no, now I can't see. Oh, and then he gets his eyes turned on again. And Yeah, oh. and you put my head on wrong, and no, that's not Backwards, the... Backwards, yes. All right. 
So that's that was an episode. Uh, that, that was, was uh, actually, an episode. I think actually, it was like disregarding the sexism. It was actually. I think it was actually fun. Like he, yeah, which admittedly is like saying yes. Well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> Actually, yes. Yes, that's what the final segment is. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Well, yeah, other than the rampant sex scene, which you can cut out. There can be a version of this that's exactly the same, and it's actually fun if we yeah. had the rooks and the crows. I guess so, yes. Because uh, as unimportant as that wouldn't, montage wouldn't it, wouldn't is... It, no, hang on. I know okay. what it's like. It's like the H.G. Uh, uh, Wells, uh, when, they're in oh. the, in, when they're in the future, when you've got the... the uh, what the are they Eloy called again? The Eloy and, and the Morlocks. The Morlocks, yes, yeah, in, the, in the time machine. That's pretty much what's going on here. Yeah, Except here, no, it's the Eloy. It's here, it's the Eloy oh, actually, who, who, yeah, who, who yeah. live underground and make and things. And the Morlocks are predating are, the Morlocks, right? Yes, sort of ish. Yeah, while also giving them pain delight. and delight. It's it, you. Can, you did it as well. So did delight. you, Greg, yeah. because you wrote the synopsis here. Yeah, you kept talking about pain and pleasure. It's not pain and pleasure. Play the clip. Pain and delight. Pain and delight, isn't it? Very good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now thank- that shouldn't be a recurring segment where it, no, <laughs> where it's, no, no, we no. sort of take each other to task. Let's do not do that. Let's keep this nice and positive and joyful. Yes. All right. Energize. Energize. <laughs> Maybe that's how we end the episode. Energize. We just yell energize. And then, For, Greg, uh, do you want to do the rest? We oh. talked about like uh, which uh, you know you have to. The, every captain has the thing. Oh, yeah. I'm, mine is, I don't know what mine's going to be. Oh, finally. Fortnatigheid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have fun with that. Maybe that'll be our Klingon word of the day next time. Oh, I forgot to do Klingon word of the day. All next right. time. Next, next time, time we'll be back. Right. Thank you very much for joining us. And Enterprise. Energize. Energize. <laughs> no, not, even, not even thank you. We'll leave that to Greg. Just, Good luck just do it with me. Good Here. luck with that, Eddie. <laughs> this is all in, baby. Just yell it with me. Three, two, one. Energize. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode with your friends Kay and Kaki, production and editing by your chief engineer Greg, and music by Fox Amore. Join us next time for Deep Space Nine Season 3, Episode 23, Family Business. Visit joyoftrek.com slash links to send us your recommendations, support us on Patreon, or find us on Blue Sky, Instagram, and Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to The Joy of Trek, and we'll see you out there. <laughs>